So I'm going to be telling stories with Wikipedia today. Now you're going to see a lot of writing on these screens. I want you to more or less ignore the font on the screens. It's more just a visual for you to, for me to be able to tell the stories better. If you'd like to take photos of the screens, please do so because I'm going to be showing a succession of Wikipedia articles and you're going to probably be curious enough to want to go back and look at the Wikipedia articles because I'm just going to sum them up real quickly. So please do take lots of photos. I'm fine with that. I also, so don't try to read it. It's just kind of a thing that we do, but I, I uh, just don't. I have potatoes. I will throw, no. Um, I will, I'm going to let you know right ahead of time, I am probably going to try to recruit you to join either my Wikipedia project, the GSOW project, or I'm going to at least have you to become an advocate for what we're doing. And at least you should be leaving with a little more knowledge about Wikipedia. I have several of my editors here. So if you have questions about editing or you just have a question about what the heck is Wikipedia and why is it this and that, I'll send you to somebody else who will probably be better taking the, uh, the questions than I have. Oh, I was going to set my timer. Let me just do that really quick. Oh, wow. I just got a text message. No, I'm only kidding. Um, I'm the human timer. Are you the human timer? Well, I was just going to run my thing because I, I have it set. So... Um, Okay, so we'll, we'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, go to this screen. Isn't that cool? So this is, um, we're going to be telling our stories. The people I'm going to be talking about today are just a few people I have chosen because they have very unusual stories on Wikipedia. And when we tell stories on Wikipedia, what we're trying to do is we don't want to tell gossipy stories. We don't want to have anything like that. We want to tell the story of a person, but we want to sum it up in such a way that whoever's reading the article will start at the top of the article and be curious enough to read all the way down. We're also trying to show that our scientists and the people who represent the science community and the skeptic community are real people, not people who have... Um, you know, that were born in an ivory tower and they, you know, everybody's a professor. These are people who have life struggles and have had issues in their life and are real kinds of people. So I'm going to go through about nine different stories and I'll do them fairly quick. This is the longest one I'm going to be talking about. Does anybody who doesn't already seen this slide or seen this presentation of sorts know what this is that you're looking at on the screen here? Recognize it. That is Hell Bop. That is Comet Hell Bop. Does everybody remember Hell Bop when that happened? 1995, 97, I'm trying to remember. 95. So Hell Bop was an unusual incident that happened. We had, uh, I'm not going to tell the story of Hell Bop. I'm going to talk about the people behind Hell Bop. I'm going to talk about Hell and Bop. Now, the Wikipedia page, Comet Hell Bop, we did not write this article. We have, I don't know if we've ever had anything to contribute to it. But we, this is not what I'm going to be talking about today because this is well written. But maybe you've been curious, I don't know, of why it's called Hell Bop. And there's a reason. And why is it not Bop Hale? Why is it Hell Bop? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So here's Alan Hale. And Alan Hale is a, uh, he was born in Japan. And all the information I'm giving you is straight from the Wikipedia page. His father was in the Air Force and he transferred to New Mexico whenever he was a baby. So he was raised in New Mexico, and he credits his love of science with having clear, clear skies in, in New Mexico and being able to, he loved the U.S. Space Force and all the information they put out about uh, the Space Force. He loved Star Trek, yeah, you know, live long and prosper, everybody. He spent a lot of time at libraries, and he loved dinosaurs. He had all the dinosaurs memorized, and he drove his parents crazy about his dinosaurs. He graduated from high school, he joined the Navy, he got a job in, uh, he was working in physics, and he worked for JPL, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He went back to school and he got his degree in astronomy. He founded a New Mexico Astronomy Institute, and what their mission was is to, to use astronomy to break down barriers. And he says science is a universal language, and he really felt that it was important to get kids in, involved in science. And now this is Thomas Bopp, Thomas Bopp was born in Denver. He moved as a child to Ohio, and his father taught him to love astronomy. That was, that was his, his father was the reason why he really got into astronomy. He used to sit on the porch steps out, out, outside of his house in Ohio, and they'd see a meteor shower go over, and his father explained that to him. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. And so... Um, they went back to school. He went back to school. Oh, he, his father gave him a telescope, a little 10-inch telescope when he was a little boy. He joined the Air Force. He moved to Arizona. He got married, had a, 
uh, became a father, and then he went back to school and he took astronomy classes. So he is not an astronomer, professional astronomer, which is what Ellen Hill is. He, he joined an astronomy club in Phoenix. So he's just some guy who showed up, right? That's basically who he is. So there's Alan Hill. Um, Alan Hill, this photo was taken by the person who's in charge of the, the New Mexicans for Science and Reason. I will be there next week and doing the exact same skeptic camp in New Mexico. So the uh, same thing, the first time they're doing something like this, same kind of thing like, we're doing a skeptic camp? Okay. So this is a photo taken of uh, Comet, I mean, of, of Hale. Now, photos on Wikipedia cannot be uploaded by, we can't just take a photo off the internet. We have to upload, the, the photo has to be uploaded by the photographer. So if you are a person that has any photographs of anything that you've taken at a lecture or somebody who was your neighbor or whatever, we would appreciate having those things uploaded to Wikipedia. So we could use those for articles because that's the only article, picture we have of him. Not a great picture. I mean, it's okay. So he says, here's, here's Alan Hill. He says, there's an entire generation that has come of age having never seen the dark sky. And they, like I said, they would take children and, and have them uh, go out and see astronomy, you know, out in the real astronomy, be able to look through telescopes and look into the night sky. Um, and we're going back to this slide here. I got myself confused. Okay. So what happened with Hale Bopp, let me go back to this really quick, is um, Alan, I'm going to tell you this story how it happened. July 22nd, 1995. So they're out, not together. They do not know each other. So Hale, and, Hale has seen a lot of comets. And he's out in New Mexico, like I think it's at his house. And he's looking up in the sky and he says, wow. That looks like a comet. And then he's looking on his paper. It's 1995, right? So he's looking on his book, and he's trying to see if there's another comet or whatever. And he's like, that doesn't, what? And they're tracking it. And so he's writing it down and stuff. And he's like, it's moving. So you have to follow it for a while to see that it's a comet. So Hale was just like, what the heck? So he's looking over it for, for a, a long time. And then he sends an email to the people who manage this. There are people who are in charge of naming them and keeping track of what it is. And they're, and this is important for you to remember, their name is the Central Bureau for Ast Astronomical Telegrams. They've been around a long time, and that's when they used to do telegrams was, was the way they did things. So Bob had never seen a comet before. So whenever, oh, I shouldn't go over to that screen yet. So whenever he, so he had never seen a comet, so he's out in Arizona, again, just hanging out with his friends that are also into astronomy. He's looking through the telescope, and he says, what is, what's that blurry thing right there? And they're like, blurry, fuzzy thing? What are you talking about? He goes, that thing. And they're looking at it, and they start looking at the charts, and they see it's not on any charts. And then again, they watch it for a while, and, he's, and he sees that it's moving, and it's not on any charts. They're like, I think it's a comet, and that's really cool. So what happens with um, Bop is he has a phone. I guess it was he had a portable phone of some sort, but he didn't have reception out in the desert. So he drives in to closer to town, he stops at a phone booth, remember those? And he realizes he does not have the phone number to get a hold of these people. So what does he do? These very literalist kind of people who in our society follow the rules of whatever, he sends them a telegram. So his, his via Western Union, so his thing came after Hale's. So we don't know who saw the comet first, Hale or Bop, but because Hale sent an email, his name's first. So it could have been Bob Hill, but that's how it works. So he had, by the time they got the telegram, they'd already received three, three emails. So afterwards, they go around, they travel around. The media is like, oh my gosh, you guys are amazing and interviewing them. But there's not a lot of great science um, journalists out there that are asking them questions. And this becomes a serious problem. And I'll show you why it becomes a serious problem very soon. So the journalists don't really understand what's going on. They're having to explain what is a comet, how come it's this, blah, 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 what does that mean? And USA Today, they interviewed Hale, I think it was Hale, for um, 45 minutes. And they asked him all these questions, and he explained all this kind of stuff. And he says, he says this quote, he says, they said, what's this about a UFO falling behind you, uh, Hellbop? I guess it was like a conspiracy theory at the time. And he said, oh, I'm going to go meet the aliens when they land at Roswell, and I'm going to confront them following my comet, my comet. And they took it, 
as this. They wrote this. Hill says he's going to go to Roswell to meet the spacecraft when it lands. And that, there's a lot of people who took that seriously, meaning, so the media got it wrong because they didn't really understand about astronomy. They didn't have great science journalists. And let me tell you, right now it's even more of a struggle than at the time in 1995. A lot of uh, newspapers, and probably Eric is going to nod her head, a lot of places don't have science journalists like they used to have. They cut budgets, they cut the science bill. You know, I don't know if they give it to sports or what, but they used to have teams of people who would do science, and they had professionals who would handle the science. They'd look it over. Now it's like they're reading the Wikipedia articles, and they're getting a lot of the information from there. They're asking a friend. They call up some person, and they're like, I need, I need a quote now. So it's not as like it was even in 95, and this was a problem. So does everybody remember what happened in 1995? What happened after that was Hale, Bop, Comet, Heaven's Gate. So if anybody doesn't remember this, you can check it out, look it up later, Heaven's Gate. It's really awful. These people committed suicide because they believed that there was a spacecraft following the comet. So things have repercussions. You know, it was, it was bad. So this is, this is Doe. And that, that was his, um, one of his famous photos. He used to do all these videos. Anyway. So um, that's kind of what ended up happening with that. Now, um, Hale said at an FFRF rally, which is the Freedom From Religion Foundation rally in 97, he said, another victory for ignorance. And then Thomas Bopp had another incident. Uh, this, this quote is also in his Wikipedia page. He tells us to National Geographic, this has been the worst week of my life and, and the best week of my life. And you won't know why that is true unless you were to read the Wikipedia article, which my team members did when they wrote this. They went into great depth and they got some great information. And the best life, best week of his life was because he's famous. He's got a comet named after him. Every media agency is trying to get, get a piece of him. But the worst part was is that his brother and his sister-in-law went out to photograph Bob on a dark road and ended up crashing and dying. They, in, uh, they took pictures of the comet, and then they were coming into town, and I don't know what happened, but they ended up dying. So that same week that the comet was brightest in the sky and the media's seeking this guy out, his, his uh, sister-in-law and his brother died. So it was very awful. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you these really quick. These are, uh, this is Alan Hill. So one of the things that we do with my Wikipedia team, and I do have a team of people. We do all the training. We do all the mentoring. This is the uh, Wikipedia page for Alan Hale. Uh, before and after. So this is the, bef oh, that's Thomas Bob. Okay, so here's Alan Hill on the right-hand side. Again, you can't read it, so don't worry about it. But that's what it looked like before we were involved. So there was only um, eight citations. And then on now, this is the current page. You can see there's already 38 citations on here. And that, I just put those on there so that you can kind of see that the whole page fit on one little tiny screen right there. And now the page is so massive that we have to have, I can't even show you the article because it's just, it's just there. Now this is Thomas Bopp. This was his entire Wikipedia article before we were involved. And you can see that it's a pretty awful thing, but it, it does have at least a photo of him. And then this is what the Wikipedia page looks like now is that it's, it's got this massive um, uh, citations. So now I'm going to tell a few more stories. These are, these are going to go a little bit quicker than what I did right there. These are some more people that are the people of science that you may, may know or you should know. And again, if you want to take pictures of these screens, that's fine. So this person right here is Archie Cochran. Anybody heard of Archie Cochran? Okay, he's very important to your lives, but you don't know that he's important to your lives. He, he, was, a, he was a Scottish man, and he was a doctor. And as a young man, he was affected by, uh, like, his uh, he had family members dying of tuberculosis, and he had, uh, there was a lot of problems. So he was in, um, his father was killed in World War I. That's how, how long ago it was. He had, uh, uh, his brother died of tuberculosis. He, um, he, rely, he was from a wealthy family, but I guess he ended up having to rely on uh, scholarships to go to college. So he ended up becoming a doctor. And he had this condition that was a very painful condition. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's called poor Furrea. It's a nervous system. It's 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 very painful. It's P O R P H Y R I A. If anybody knows how to pronounce that, porphyria. It's a very painful thing, but it wasn't treatable in in the UK. So what it ends up happening, he goes to Germany because that's where you can be treated. So he moves to Germany in 1931. Anybody realize what's going on in Germany about 1931? So that's when he moves to Germany. He ends up joining the British Army. 
He ends up serving in World War II. He's captured. He has, to, he has to be a doctor in a prison or war camp because he's captured. And what he realizes while he's over there in these prison or war camps is that medicine is not, um, there is no proof that ev evidence that medicine works. Nobody's done randomized trials up until the 1940s, right? Pretty scary. So he finds out that the NHS, which is the National Health uh, Services over in UK, they were just publishing that things worked just because they wanted to say that they worked. Nobody had proved that anything had worked. So what he ends up doing is he ends up learning how to do randomized trials. He comes out with uh, um, the idea of aspirin and vascular disease and, and, and doing trials. So this man, Archie Cochran, is the father of evidence-based medicine. That's what people say. So this man, because of him, you're able to um, get health care that supposedly works, right? So you at least have a way of testing it. So oops, let me go back over here. I forgot I have to hit a button. So now what you're going to see is there's no sound on this. This is just a very slow scroll of what the Wikipedia article looked like before. And you can see that it's um, kind of like, you know, it's OK. There's some references and there's some kind of things on here. There's external links as well. But what you're going to see uh, here in a second is what the Wikipedia page looks like now, which is much more respectful of the person Archie Cochran. So it's a person you've never heard of before, but he has a very interesting life, and he impacts everybody's lives daily, but you just never knew that he was this guy. So this is now the Wikipedia page after my, my uh, Wikipedia team that I'm hoping to recruit you for is um, um, looks like now. And I, I want to emphasize that um, we uh, I, have, I do all the training, and um, I ha can train anybody. <laughs> anybody wants to learn, I can train. So this is now what the Wikipedia article looks like. And it's much more respectable for, for Archie Cochran, which is what we should do. Most of the work we do is in languages outside of English. Half of the work we do is in languages outside of English. Um, Alton Lemon. Anybody heard of Alton Lemon? You have? Yep. Well, the Lemon Test. Thank you. The Lemon Test. You've heard of the Lemon Test? Do you think it has anything to do with lemons? Cars. Or cars? OK, so what the uh, Got a Wikipedia article for you to read. So this is also written by GSW. Everything has been. He was a social worker, civil rights activist. He was in the US Army. He was a member of the ACLU and the NAACP. Worked for the Department of Energy and Housing. He coined the term ethical humanism. Um, he was a plaintiff in Lemon versus Kurtz, Kurtzman. Anybody remember that? 1971. Tax funds paid to parochial schools. So your money went, to, your tax dollars went to schools to fund church schools. So that was the reason why they, they have this um, uh, this uh, battle, you know, this civil um, court court thing. And now that's why we don't have it. But if you will, I will be talking about in a moment uh, that that is about that is very likely to change, and our tax dollars are, as we all know, are very close to becoming. Um, uh, used for all kinds of things that we probably wouldn't want our tax dollars used for because this this is being attacked the uh, lemon law the this kind of thing so possibly it has something to do with the lemon law with cars and stuff like that I, I didn't read it in depth but again this is a Wikipedia article we wrote entirely so this page did not exist until one of my Wikipedia editors decided they would write this so there's a lot of erosion between the church and state right now. I don't think anybody anybody noticed that. There's some kind of it's kind of odd. Yeah. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a thing that's going on there. So um, this is G Eugenie Scott. She's a wonderful person. She's she is one of the people who is in. Um, she was involved in a lot of court cases with creationism being taught in the schools and prayer in schools, and she's done a lot of that kind of stuff. She has uh, done a, she did a talk at PSYCON, which I hope you will all attend this year. It's October in Vegas. Um, amazing conference. So you can find this video online if you want to look and take a picture of it so that you will have this to look at later. But this is on the Center for Inquiries um, YouTube channel which I hope you all subscribe to. And she did a talk that was very depressing because she talked about how there is a severe erosion and, uh, of the church and state and how it's very soon that they're likely to, um, it's, they're nipping at the bud to get into, get that law over change. So we're going to have some serious problems real quick. Okay, now I'm going to speed up a little bit. Anybody know who Kendrick Fraser is? 
So if you guys are uh, subscribers to Skeptical Inquirer magazine, he was a longtime founder, um, um, editor of, of uh, Skeptical Inquirer. He's a very kind man, one of the kindest men I've ever known. And we wrote his Wikipedia article, or I should say we rewrote it, because this is what it looked like before this crappy thing. Um, that's a technical word, by the way. <laughs> So it was just this awful Wikipedia article that was no photo. It was just not in great shape. That's it. That, I just scrolled through the whole thing. So that was it. That's what it looked like beforehand. And then after my team member came in and, and re-edited it, they, they turned it into something that's a lot more respectable. Um, Ken Frazier did die recently, last year. And um, I am very proud to say that he has a, a fabulous Wikipedia article, including an audio clip and photos and... It, it's much more respectful of him, and it makes me feel just glowingly knowing this kind of thing about that this, we created this that exists for him. Now, I'm going to show you a slide that I know you have not seen. You've never heard of this person before. So this is, uh, this is Michelle, and her last name is Baldwin. Now, what you don't know about her is she is the daughter of the person I just showed you his Wikipedia article. This is Lady Ginga. Now, um, Ganja, Ganga? Ganga? Ganga, yeah. So what ends up happening is I end up finding a documentary on this woman, and I, I don't even know how I found it. And I said to myself, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm reading this, and I'm looking at this documentary, and I said, she could have a Wikipedia page. So I asked one of my friends um, on GSOW, that's the Wikipedia page, uh, team I run, I asked her, I said, you, you're the personality to be able to deal with this. It's, it's a very powerful article, and I'm going to tell you why. So what ends up happening is she is a young woman in America with no medical insurance because she leaves college and decides she wants to go into kayaking. She wants to do, um, she wants to be on the water. So she follows her passion. Of course, she has no medical insurance. She's American. And so what she does is she doesn't go and get into her scan, can, any treatment. She doesn't go to any kind of scans or anything. So she ends up starting to have a lot of pain, and she finally goes to a doctor, and she's got stage four um, cancer. And she's got three to six months to live. So what Michelle does is she decides that instead of just whatever you do in the last few months of your life, she learned how to stand up paddleboard, where you stand up and you can paddleboard. Somebody taught her how to do it. And she decided to go to India. And she takes her mother and a person who does the documentary films and what he does is he films her going along the river. And what, as she goes along the river very slowly, and she could spend up to 10 hours on this stand-up paddleboard down the river. As she's going along, they talk about cancer screenings and getting checked and, and that kind of thing as she goes. And it was very, very amazing. So what ends up happening is she, she's die, she dies a few months later. And she ends up, um, uh, years, uh, several years later, they go back to India and another documentary uh, crew goes by and what they do is they go into these small villages and they start and they educate the the women there about cancer screenings and they take them in a bus on a long road to go and they get and they get checked for for I think it was cervical cancer so they all go and they get that done and so they were doing this in different villages and there was at least one woman who was there in her 40s turns out she was at the beginning stages of of uh, of cancer, so they were able to nip it in the bud right away, and it was really kind of rewarding because she had this young son, and and it was like you know she would never have been treated. She would it was just one of these very poor areas that would never have been treated. So this woman was extremely inspiring. There's a documentary out on her, and it's just an emotional kind of thing because it was it's she's just a regular person who loved the water so much that she wanted to she wanted to show people that we could make a difference. So I hope you'll read this Wikipedia page, it's Lady Ganga, and uh, this is what it looks like now. Now, Ken Frazier and his wife did never ask me to write this Wikipedia article, which I found really amazing because she was obviously ready to write this. She was, she was primed for a Wikipedia article, and I find her very inspiring. She, uh, she really was able to follow her passion and do what she really wanted to do. And there's one more photo that's going to show up here real quick. Let me see. And then I have just a couple more to go. And I just wanted to make sure I showed you one of the photos of her and what it was like. It's a very shallow area that she's paddle boarding in. And so people would walk right out to her in the water. And they would see this woman. She looked very unusual compared to what people normally were on the water, I guess. And they would ask her questions. And she would sit and talk to them about what it was like and what, why she was doing this and, and getting screened for cancer and so on. 
So that's that is Michelle Baldwin. She was uh, Ken Frazier's daughter, and and I told you she, he was a very kind man. So he did, he did a lot and taught uh, her a lot. Okay, so this is Cresswell uh, Eastman. This Wikipedia page did not exist either before we, we wrote it. And it's amazing because I don't know why he wouldn't have a Wikipedia page. He's a clinical professor of medicine. He's in uh, Australia. He has not died yet that I know of. Um, he he uh, publicized iodine in your diet. So what was happening in a lot of third world countries or areas that doesn't have does not have a lot of um, uh, medical care, he taught that what you have to do is you have to have iodine in your diet. Because if you don't have iodine in your diet, especially if you're pregnant, your child will end up having uh, like a brain, um, uh, they're, they're, it's like having lead in your diet. You know, you're not going to have the strongest uh, mental capacities to be able to do things. Also problems with walking and stuff like that. So what Cresswell would do is he would go into uh, third, uh, these countries, and you'll see pictures slide past really quick, that are um, showing that he would go into these areas and he would educate people in like Thailand and um, um, Malaysia and small villages and areas like that. So this man is credited as having, they, they call him the man who saved a million brains. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those things that, that you probably didn't know about, but he actually had a huge impact on the world. He, I guess people only need like one teaspoon of uh, iodine on your entire life. I didn't know that. But if you're lactating or if you're, if you're pregnant, you need more than that. You need to make sure you have it during the pregnancy to be able to give it to your infant child to protect them so that their brain is safe. But this is something we didn't know about before. Amazing. Look at all these awards and look at all this stuff. Nobody thought to write this Wikipedia article until one of my Australian editors decided to do this. My biggest team, by the way, is outside of the United States are Australians. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Because of the skeptic zone, hey, Richard, um, I get to uh, talk about what GSOW does um, on skeptic zone. So I'm often on there. And plus, I've been on a tour of... Uh, there a few times. Another man you've never heard of, Stanley Plotkin. Anybody heard of this man? Uh, if you know of Paul Offit, do you remember who Paul Offit is? Who is the man, one of the people who worked with Fauci that gives you your flu vaccines and decides if your flu vaccine is okay and, and the coronavirus and all that stuff. So, so this was uh, Paul Offit, and this is one of his mentors. And this is Stanley Plotkin. And Stanley Plotkin, um, anybody here ever suffer from German measles? Because you're vaccinated. Also, uh, rabies, uh, uh, robovirus, um, lots of things. So he, this man created a lot of the vaccines that we are using today and that make us here. I mean, the chairs next to you could have been filled with, the empty chairs could have been filled with people who might have had, who could have been vaccinated a long time ago and, and they weren't. So Stanley Plotkin is uh, one of these amazing people. At the age of, uh, he wanted to be a pilot. And uh, the thing about it was is that he went into medicine, and we're all better about it because he did. But what happened with um, him is he wanted to join the Air Force. So what he did is when he turned 77, he learned to fly a plane. And, and he's still alive, and uh, he's kind of retired now. But he, came, he was really popular during, well, he was in the news a lot during the uh, pandemic because he was 88 or, wait, wait, that's the wrong one. He was 88 or something like that whenever he, I must have hit a button. Sorry, you guys, just ignore this. Um, I think that what happened with him is that he was 88 years old, and back when we were getting the vaccines and nobody knew how to get them, you know, it was like right at the beginning when we finally rolled them out, he went, I think the Washington Post did an article on him because he was complaining. He's like, I'm 88 years old. How can my wife and I not figure out how to do this? How do I get my vaccine, you know? So the news picked up on that, and they thought it was quite funny. But it was true. I mean, my gosh, how are you supposed to be at 88 years old if you don't know how to navigate all this stuff? It was, it was confusing. How do I make an appointment? What's going on? Where do I find the information? Seems like a charming man. But the thing about Stanley Plotkin was is that after we wrote his Wikipedia article, uh, we reached out to Paul Offit and told him. And Stanley Plotkin wrote back to me and he said, oh my gosh, I, I, this is just amazing that somebody cares. You know, He says, I can't believe of what I've achieved. I did, seeing it on the Wikipedia article was like, Look at all I've achieved. Oh, my gosh. He was really blown away by it. And, and that there would be a group of people who cared enough to do this. We don't get paid. So it was like it's just a love thing we do. 
This is the last person I'm going to talk about, and this is another person who may have touched your lives. Anybody here read books as children on cryptozoology, uh, UFOs, you know, those scholastic books that you would get? And Brian Dunning talks about this a lot, is that those stories brought a lot of us to science because we were interested in spontaneous human combustion, and we were interested in, and like, you know, the Loch Ness Monster and the, and the Bermuda Triangle. And we read those books. Well, this man, Daniel Cohen, who is not a scientist, he wrote a lot of those books. And when I went back and I looked at my, my old books of children's books, he was the author for a lot of them. And he wrote them with a skeptical tint. You know, if you read him, the ghost stories he would write, in the beginning he would say, these are fun stories you would tell at a fireplace, you know, fire, uh, fireside. These are not real, but they're fun stories. Tell them to your friends. So we wrote this Wikipedia page for, for Daniel. And it, it's very sad. Uh, he wrote about Challenger, which was really interesting, the astronauts of Challenger. He wrote the biographies of, for children to understand what happened with Challenger. So, he, so it's quite ironic. His wife was a reporter for CNN, and he wrote hundreds of books, from what I understand. Now, the thing about uh, Daniel Cohen that you wouldn't know, this is his Wikipedia article before, which is really awful, what you don't know about Daniel Cohen is that he had one child, only one child. Her name is Theodora. And when she was 21 years old, she was coming back from Europe. And she was flying home. And her plane was blown up over Lockerbie, Scotland. So she fell to her death. And, well, she blew up probably in the air, but it was very awful. And Daniel Cohen and his wife were responsible for really holding Libya up to... Um, to getting the funding. They wouldn't take the money from Libya, but they took the money from, I think it was from the airlines because they didn't protect it. I don't remember, but it was a big deal. Uh, and they wrote about it and they advocated for the other uh, people who were um, uh, victims, uh, families, because they were also, they were, you know, reporter and writers, so they had more of an audience. They were able to get better settlements and they were able to, to advocate for it and hold it in the news, which is why a lot of people know about the flight that, that blew up. And it's sad that this is one of the things he is known for, but this is what happens to people. And so um, Daniel Cohen was another one of those people that you probably had not heard of before. But these are, this is an article I wrote for Skeptical Inquirer. You could take a picture of this if you want to read this. But I asked a lot of friends of mine if they had, what were the stories that they read when they were children that brought them to have a love of science later in life. And, this, and people gave me a lot of different suggestions. And as they were sending me screenshots of their photos of their books, Daniel Cohen was a lot of them who was writing the books. And I thought that was really amazing. But um, so just uh, the final slides here. I'm uh, really close to the end. And this is a nice slide. Rob brought this up to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, who's one of my GSW editors. He's written a lot of stuff. Um, so the GSOW project that I run is a Wikipedia team. It's unusual because we do not operate training with Wikipedia, which is unusual. Everything's done in a secret cabal <laughs> located on Facebook, and I do all the training. And that is not normal for Wikipedia. Wikipedians are trained normally by themselves. They're self-trained. So a lot of people who are Wikipedians are IT people, people who already know how to code, that kind of stuff. What I do is I, I, um, I am um, trying to find more people who are not necessarily coders, people who are regular people, you know, who live normal lives, and so that we can have better, more unique Wikipedia articles told with a better perspective of maybe more emotion, like some of the articles I've, I've read to you today. Less clinical, here's the resume, like a CV, and more personal stories that make it so that people are more interested in reading the Wikipedia articles and you have a little more pride and a little more respect for these people. So training takes about four months. You must be on Facebook, because I train using, um, uh, Google Documents, and we do a lot of mentoring, and, our, and our, our cabal is on Facebook. It's a hidden page. You can't find it. Only, only people in our group can find it. So it is, it is something that is intense. Uh, please talk to Rob or Jeff or Romero or uh, over here. We have Mr. Gutentag is also one of our editors. Um, raise your hand. There you go. So um, we have quite a few people that have, are part of my team that are here. We find that Wikipedians are doers. We tend to people, the people on my GSOW team are people who have raised their hand and said, I want to do more. What can I do? And I'm like, you can learn how to edit Wikipedia and you can make a lot of difference. Now, we keep track of all the pages we have written or taken from a horrible stub into something beautiful. 
We can't keep track of all the edits we've made because there would be millions. But we only can track those pages. So what we do is I have this program somebody built for me, Kyle Polish from the Data Skeptic Podcast. He made a program software for me where I can take all the pages that we've written and half of them, almost half of them in languages outside of English, because we know pseudoscience does not end at a border anywhere. And he's put those into this program so I can use. And what it does is it allows me to know if, how many times a page has been looked at. I can't tell if a person is looking at it repeatedly, like the same person, and I can't tell if the person is um, uh, reading the whole thing or if they're only there for a couple seconds. But I can tell that they've accessed the page. Now, we know this number is, an, is not a real number because we know that when somebody writes a Wikipedia article, the uh, journalist, um, media, lots of people are getting that information from the Wikipedia article and they're disseminating it. We know our words are taken literally, plagiarized out of the article and used in articles. We know this. So even though somebody hasn't gone to the Wikipedia article, they're still getting the content that's on our Wikipedia articles. So this is an interesting, I put the number up here because this changes daily so I can, I can get this. So right now we have written, did you look, Rob, how many pages we've written? No, I didn't see that. It's 2,212, I think, something like that. That's what we've done in about 10 years. That's amazing. And it's because of my amazing people. I know, I've only written like 50, so I mean, it's, there's, there's people who've written lots more, or they've written more, they get a lot more views than what I do. But, so it's the people, and so those 2,200 and whatever Wikipedia articles have now viewed as of this morning 167,919,382 times. That's how many times people have looked at our work. So if somebody is writing a book, and Rob likes to talk about this a lot, if somebody writes a book, and they get it published, which is awesome because we can use that book for Wikipedia references, by the way. But if they write a book, you know, maybe in the lifetime of the book you get a thousand purchases off of it. That's really awesome. But if you've got a Wikipedia article, like, you know, one of these people, they can hit some of the specialty anti-vaccine work we've done. Uh, anybody's read, uh, you guys heard of this guy who's running for president, uh, Robert Kitty? What's his name? You heard of him? He has an organization called the Children's Health Defense. That sounds very innocuous, right? Children, health, defense, that sounds good. Sounds like a good guy, right? So we wrote the Wikipedia part, uh, page for the um, children's health defense, and that's just hit half a million views. And so we wrote that in English, and I think we wrote it in Portuguese. Uh, I think it's in French, but I don't know if we wrote it in French, but we're about to write it. We're about to publish it in Spanish because we think that's important. So uh, we are, we've been doing this since 2010. We've been helping children. We've been helping students um, uh, plagiarize since 2010. <laughs> we feel like if they're going to go to Wikipedia, you might as well make sure that the stuff they get is the best stuff possible. This is the organization I run, About Time Project. We are, um, I have fingers on a lot of pies. You're welcome to talk to me later or talk to the people here. This is just, a, Wikipedia is just one thing that I run. I also run a, 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 a YouTube channel that works on psychic. Psychics is, some people only know me as psychic related. Mediumship, that's all they know me for and they're like, you do Wikipedia too? And some people are Wikipedia and they're like, you do psychics also? That's like a whole different area. So I have a channel on YouTube, it's called Psychics Explained. And what I do is I go into great detail of explaining what is actually going on. I mean, I go way into the weeds and we listen to the readings and we look at the words and we really explain it. I have a swag over here on this table if, you're, if you are interested. And if you have trouble kind of finding my website, you might try looking it up this way. It's the same website on YouTube, Psychic Sex Explained, because get it? Get it? Psychic Sex Explained. <laughs> See, Psychics Explained, it's the same thing, it's just, so if you have problems finding my, my YouTube channel, try this, maybe it'll stick in your mind a little bit more. Thank you, Rob. Um, so if you want more information about the projects that I'm on, this is where you're gonna find information about that, or you can contact me, I'm easy to get a hold of um, About Time Project, and that is my presentation. Thank you for your attention.